Yeah. Welcome. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Jackie Sykes, and um, I'm sure you know pretty much why we're here, but it's important to know the potential damage to Sydney Park is just another example of the lack of logical planning by West Connex as it weaves a destructive path through a swathe of Sydney suburbs. Public speaking, I shouldn't tell you that. Um, as I expect many of you are aware, the extensions to the M5 tunnel will emerge into four tiers of interchange at St Peter's, with most of the traffic directed along a six-lane highway south of the park into seven lanes to the east, suddenly merging into, well, four lanes but two with parking in McAvoy Street. In the process, sections of Sydney Park will be absorbed into those roads and over a thousand trees will be wantonly cut down. We hope that you'll become part of our project to adopt a tree, which I shall explain after our speakers. Our key speaker today is Professor Emeritus Helen Armstrong. Dr Armstrong was the inaugural Professor of Landscape Architecture at Queensland University of Technology from 90, 1997 to 2003. She is currently a practicing landscape architect and research associate with the Centre for Cultural Research, UWS. In the 1980s, she established the Cultural Landscape Research Unit, which has undertaken a diverse range of cultural landscape studies on Australian landscape and sense of place. Since 2004, she has been exploring ways to hold productive land. She has recently published a book, Marginal Landscape, which focuses on derelict sites. Currently, she is part of a UWS team looking at the impact of urban, he, urban heat islands in Penrith and the importance of maintaining existing urban trees. Don't we know about that? With pleasure, I introduce Dr. Helen Armstrong. Hello. Are you comfortable enough? Yeah. <laughs> um, now, I want to tell you a long story, so I hope that you'll um, speed me up if it's taken too long. But essentially, we all know um, that trees enable us as humans to live. We all know this. We all know that they provide habitats for other animals on this planet. We're just in beginning to understand about the root systems. We're just beginning to understand that the root systems have a kind of knowing, particularly where they're growing, trees are growing in groups, like in Sydney Park. But I want to tell you a story about the cultural value of the trees in Sydney, but also in New South Wales country towns. Now you might think, how is this relevant to Sydney Park? But what I want to show you is the incredible um, importance in terms of the world of this heritage, not just how we're passionate about the trees. Because I think it's a unique story and it comes about because of what was happening in Europe in, and in Britain in the 18th century. When you adopt a tree, you're not just undertaking the care of that tree, you're also going to be stewards of an unusual aspect of Australia's heritage. So I'm just going to go through chronologically. Bear with me as I start in the 1750s. <laughs> <laughs> of course, this was the mid 18th century and the age of enlightenment, which had been going for a while. Now, what is really interesting is that round about then, um, scholars became interested in the natural sciences. And botany was the first science, not zoology. Darwin and zoology came later, but botany was the first science. And also, astronomy was already of, of great interest, but botany was a new um, thing. So Cork was, of course, following the transit of Venus. It wasn't this whole thing of going and finding new lands and so on. They were scientists and they were looking for these sorts of understandings about the world. And Banks, Sir Joseph Banks, was quite young, but he had 
been given by King George III the directorship of Kew Gardens, which was really quite new. And he was a very idealistic, very rich young man of noble heritage. And he wanted Kew to be the most important botanical centre in the world. So, of course, he was very keen to come on this trip. Also, at the same time, the Dutch East Indies Company was managing to find all kinds of interesting plants, which could be staples or just exotically interesting. So, there was a currency, an actual monetary currency, of plants, exotic plants, and the fruits, and so on. So it was in this kind of atmosphere that you started to get um, Banks and Cook moving around to um, Australia. And the French were nibbling at the edges. Now that got right up the Brit's nose. So there was almost a sort of urgency about it. Um, now Cooks and Banks returned to England um, in 1770. Banks with this extraordinary, okay, extraordinary collection of plants. And um, he showed these to um, Carl Linnaeus, the great Swedish botanist, who in fact developed the nomenclature for plants. And I read through Banks's boxes of letters in London, and I found the letter where he was, uh, Linnaeus was responding to this, and he said, oh, this great South land should be called Banksia. <laughs> <laughs> so, 1770 to about 1820 in Europe was known as the era of Australian plants. And they were of great importance. And anybody, any noble person or king or queen or even um, Marie Antoinette had Australian plants in their gardens or in their conservatories. Now this meant that the nurserymen were very um, active because there was a lot of money to be made. And some of the people who settled initially were people like MacArthur and so on, they were nurserymen. And they were very keen to prevent the king's botanist from getting these plants and sending them to Kew because they wanted them, and they wanted to propagate them and market them. So there was a sort of healthy anarchy already. Um, now, the king's botanists were actually the explorers. They weren't setting out necessarily to discover more land for settlers. They were collecting the plants. And there was also a colonial botanist who was related to the Sydney Botanic Gardens. But the King's botanists, of course, had the, the higher status. And then, of course, there were the nurserymen. So what we have in 1788 through to about 17, late 1790s is this kind of fervour. And the convicts, uh, I found a letter where the convicts were, the, some of the customs men, was complaining bitterly that the convicts were wandering around everywhere with their pockets full of nuts and well, can presume banksias and bits of plants. And they were actually diving into the water, probably somewhere near the heads, and swimming out to the boats before they came through the heads to sell all of these plants and things, and bits of plants and nuts, um, much to the fury of um, the king's botanist and the customs man. Um, so, okay, so that's what's going on here. Then, at the same time, we have the effect of the industrialisation on European towns and cities, and British towns and cities. And it was pretty horrible by the late 18th century. Worse, much worse than the 19th century, but, you, you know, you could see what was happening. It was polluted, there was a lot of squalor and so on. And in that context, there was an emerging idea, probably from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, but from others too, that there could be an Antipodean Garden of Eden. You know, somewhere where you could start again and not fail the nest so badly as the Europeans had done. And uh, so 
In many ways, this new settlement was invested with that kind of dream, and of course it couldn't be more <coughs> far from the truth in terms of New South Wales, maybe it was Queensland, but New South Wales, which is where we all were. Um, and at the same time also, the French Revolution was festering. So there was a desire to find a new place um, where you could start again, not make those mistakes, and a desire for a much more organised um, town, cities, where revolution was less easily fostered. So that affected the kinds of forms that the towns were taking. Now, Philip, when he came to um, Sydney Cove, he already had a whole lot of plants that he collected, first of all from Kew, then from Cape Town, and he collected a whole lot of oaks from Cape Town, which were being used as avenues throughout Cape Town. And then over to Rio, and I don't know what, I couldn't find any records of what he collected in Rio, but I'm thinking that it might have been the stone pine, but I could be completely wrong about that. Um, and then uh, on he came to Sydney Cove. Now, while he was aboard the boat, he developed this plan for Sydney. And I don't know if any of you know about it, but it was, you know, truly elegant late Baroque <laughs> urban plan. And uh, it was to have this great wide avenue leading from the harbour up to roughly where Wynyard is now, on a diagonal so that you could look through to the heads. And on the crest would be this really imposing public building, which would probably be the government house, and important buildings flanking it down to the water. And uh, then the other streets would triangulate around it. And it was to be called Albion. And it, you know, it just looked so elegant. Anyhow, of course, <laughs> nothing like that happened. By an accident of history, the soldiers were on one side, and the convicts were on the other side, which messed up the whole plan. And anyhow, they were all starving, so they forgot about it. But then he went over to Parramatta and laid out another town. This time he laid it out, or it was laid out. It was another one of these really fine Baroque towns. The government house was up on the hill, an avenue 200 feet wide led down to the river. And it was said about it that it would make Pongwall hide its diminished head. <laughs> so this was the kind of ideas that certain people had about the colony. And there was a beautiful cross axis, which I think is now Church Street. So of course it was laid out. Then Philip left, and here we get the New South Wales call. The beginning of what we're dealing with today. Yes, exactly. And the first thing they did when Philip left was to build houses all over that avenue and get rid of that kind of urban form which implied, you know, a, a, a kind of authority. And of course you know the, the story of how appallingly they behave in the New South Wales Court. So that's my second thing. And um, well, I'll just back a little bit. The oaks that Philip brought were planted out as street trees in the new fledgling um, town. They mostly were nurtured by Macquarie, but of course, Sydney sandstone doesn't have much phosphorus or nitrogen, so they were very miserable. Um, and I've got some images for you that I can pass around. In fact, maybe I should stop and just do that. I, I copied about 10, so if you don't mind just sharing them with each other. Those are the stone pines. All these photos I have are 1870. And that's all the same. And then this one is another 1870 of the public um, domain. And there are the oaks, looking pretty sick. But down here are some figs, and I'll talk about those soon. So if you just want to take them out and you know, look at all the to keep them. Um, okay. So, um, 
At least I have two. Yeah. Now, as this is going on, um, the explorers, particularly Oxley and Cunningham, or Cunningham was more of a botanist, headed north and they found the modern Bay Fig. Now, some of you might say that it was growing in the Illawarra Escarpment or up near Mudgee and so on, but not in the same conditions as Morton Bay, which is volcanic soil. And so the form of the fig, when they found it, was extraordinary. And you know the beautiful form it takes and the boundless roots and so on, and the sort of wide canopy. And uh, Oxley and Cunningham both agreed this was the most magnificent shade tree that they had ever seen. And uh, Cunningham said, you know, it looks like the noble British oak in its form. Anyhow, they brought seedlings and seeds back and propagated them in the government farm, which is now Botanic Gardens. And they grew along. Um, and when Macquarie was here, he laid out Bathurst and Grafton and so on, those major towns. And the interesting thing is that the street planting occurred in those country towns. And I brought some images for you of um, Grafton. These again are 1870. So these trees have to be more than 20 years old. So that means they were planted in 1850. And this is right about the same time as Hausman was laying out his Parisian avenues. So, you know, of course the Parisian avenues are beautiful, but we had things like this in the 1850s and 1870s. And also, um, the figs were being planted in the 1860s, the um, uh, Anzac Parade figs were planted. Um, there was a first big avenue which went um, from the government farm <coughs> domain through uh, the outer domain, which of course, the car that was 1840, and the Carl Expressway wiped that out. Um, so the actual use of figs and avenues is really very early. This photo is, again, 1870. This is Hyde Park. And these are the Morton Bay Figs, which went down the Quarry Street and through Hyde Park. And um, unfortunately, they were cut, open, cut down for the um, Underground Railway in the 1930s, which is when the Hills Figs were planted. Um, there's this sort of pragmatic thing about infrastructure that keeps affecting the story too. Okay, so where have we got to? So, then Macquarie left and then Governor Darling came and this was the time when they he started to work out what the road should be like, how wide they should be, how narrow and so on. Now you may not know but the Spanish in the 16th century or Yes. 17th century, sorry, had prepared a thing called the Laws of the Indies. And this was a set of codes for how people should develop colonies. And it was generally accepted throughout Europe as the way to go. So in Australia, we followed the Laws of the Indies too. And they said that in a hot climate, streets should be narrow and they should be fringed by colonnaded buildings and then intersected with squares, which of course is what you'd see in South America. Um, but Governor Darling had been in India before he came here, and the um, compounds of, for the British uh, adjoined Indian old settlements, and they had very wide streets with large peaks overhanging for shade. And so Governor Darling said, no, the street should be wide. And um, not 200 feet, but about 150 feet, 135. So it's not because you can turn a bullock around. <laughs> it's not one of these pragmatic things. It's, again, very idealistic. A sense that there was 
a future for this place and the laying of foundations with con considered um, decisions being made. Now, as I said, Paris was busy doing its thing at the same time. Now, by the 1880s, you get the impact of all of the clearing of vegetation and the huge environmental damage and the dust storms and everything else. Now, by a sort of ironic uh, phenomenon, the Botanic Gardens, was, Sydney Botanic Gardens, were supplying the trees for streets and parks. And they were mostly supplying um, rainforest trees like brush box, um, white cedar, which you may or may not know, um, and silky oaks, and flindersia, the native teak, and these were the trees that were being planted. But they went into the country towns. It was the big problem was out there where you know, all the vegetation had been cleared, creating the dust bowl. But by some sort of strange, ironic quirk of fate, the trees were planted in the towns. So it was a kind of tokenism, a bit like the rainforest tree was a token for the Brits about the pollution of their environment. So we now have, west of, um, of Bathurst and Orange and so on, and south down to Albury and so on, incredibly strong avenues on these rainforest trees, growing in arid conditions like Broken Hill and so on. The white cedar in Narendra, unbelievable. No one would have known that these rainforest trees would survive in these conditions. <coughs> There's 10 minutes. Oh, I should wind up. Okay. So we've got, again, more and more of this. Now, I just wanted to quickly tell you about um, the Karajong, the memorial trees, because you're adopting a tree. Now, after the First World War, the, um, they decided to do memorial avenues, and they chose the Karajong tree because they saw it as symbolizing the Aussie battler. It was tough. It would survive when everything else had died. It was still there. And in Inverell even had a Currajong battalion. And you will find, if they're still there, Memorial Avenues with soldiers' names in some of the country towns that are related to that time. However, of course, many of them, like the one connecting Harden and Murrumburra, with each one named for a soldier in the town, just widened the road. Widened the road. Nobody complained. They're gone. So when you are adopting a tree, there are these um, implications of our dual heritage. Great idealism, great care, and utter pragmatism. So how, what tactics or what, what manifesto you put in place to ensure that these trees that you're adopting, you can look after and look after in perpetuity. Now I could rave on and on and on. Um, you know, I've got a three volumes thesis I could have read to. <laughs> 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 no, 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 no. I just think what you're doing is utterly important. Today, I've just been at a conference on the Anthropocene. I think today, more than perhaps at any other time, being an engaged citizen is probably the most important thing we can do. And that form of citizenship will take on lots of different shapes. But in this case, we're trying to stop unbelievably stupid projects. We don't need any more cars on our roads. The bloody light rail, of course, catches you because it's supposed to, you know, do away with cars, which of course won't. But, you know, this is the sort of um, naked um, New South Wales core writ large behaviour that we have to protest about. It's not just the loss of the trees, it's the processes that are going on. I mean, I was told that on Tuesday night, when we were all you know, very much focused on America, New South Wales government 
mm. pushed through the Crown Lands Act and the Biodiversity Act, thinking that everyone would be watching television and not notice. Now, how outrageous that they would be so corrupt as to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And this is what we have to no. name as engaged citizens. And I think adopting a tree means nurturing it with all the care and concern that you would with your children and preventing your children getting infected or damaged by other things as you, as you do anyhow, and your grandchildren and so on. So I wish you every good wish that I can, not luck, good wish, <coughs> um, with this enterprise. And um, it's part of the history. Thank you so very much, Dr. Armstrong. I feel like we've just had a tease to an amazing story here. <laughs> just the beginning. Um, look, I would relatedly like to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Gadigal people, the traditional custodians of this land. I wish to pay our respects to the elders past and present of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to any, any other Aboriginals present. Um, to get on with to what we're doing today, we are extremely fortunate to have acclaimed photojournalist Laurie Graham involved in the fight against West Connects. After a long career on staff at the Sydney Morning Herald, the National Times and the Bulletin, as well as time at the Observer in London, Laurie's work as a freelance has ranged from photographic commissions, solo and group exhibitions, to books and stills photography on films. She is a woman pioneer in Australian photojournalism who has made it her business to capture the story of what has been and is happening to our community in the battle to stop WestConnex. Look around you, you can see what she's been doing. But here's Laurie. Um, first, I would very much like to thank my comrades um, on the exhibition subcommittee, Jackie Sykes and Janet Cozzi, um, for their enthusiasm and hard work. This event would not have been possible without you. Thank you. Um, I got involved in trying to stop with Connects about 18 months ago. Um, when a few of us in Newtown started the Save Newtown Stop West Connects campaign. That's when I started um, documenting various demonstrations and events in the campaigns. One of these events was a Small World Festival in September 2015. That event was held in Sydney Park. We discovered that the area that the festival uses would be destroyed by West Connects because they want to slice the 12 metres off the park, off Houston Roadside, and destroy the thousand trees there. To highlight the devastation, we wrapped those trees in saf saffron crepe paper. The concert goers were devastated and angry that the park would be destroyed and signed more than a thousand petitions on that one day alone. This informed us that just about just how important that park is to our community. So we decided to wrap the trees that would be destroyed as a visual symbol of our campaign. John Bartholomew, a tireless campaigner, and one of our group found recycled fabric in the same colour as the West Connects brand. So we, and then we stenciled the ribbons with signs that said, condemn, save me, stop West Connects. This has had the effect of informing anyone who uses a park or drives past the park. What's going, what's coming down the line from Mike Baird and his team of destroyers at West Connects. We have the state, we have a state government that is rampaging through the inner city allowing unprecedented development with their very stupid road projects. Um, and this attacks the very lung that we have, the only lung in the inner city that we have. And that, to my mind, is criminal. This next stage of this campaign, Adopt a Tree, is asking you, the community, to take responsibility for a tree. Adopt it like you would a dog or a cat. Um, and you would look after, and, and, and we would like you to look after it and care for it in the way that you would anything that you, that you have decided to adopt. So when the chainsaws come to stand by your tree and in demonstration of solidarity against relentless and totally pointless destruction, we should send a message to Mr. Baird that 
has been, this is made all too clear from the recent Betrix, 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 <laughs> US elections. Democracy is founded on the bedrock of community opinion. Ignore the community and you threaten democracy and will be punished accordingly. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Laurie. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. Relax in a minute. Um, apart from the $17 billion of our government, state and federal, have generously handed over to the Sydney Motorway Corporation on our behalf, the direct financial toll will come as you drive through the toll gates if the project continues to go ahead. The idea behind adopting a tree is to encourage you to build a relationship with a condemned tree so that you will want to be out in the park to defend it when the chainsaws arrive, as Laurie has said. So what do you do to adopt a tree? We have some ribbons here for which we would welcome a contribution of your choice towards funding our campaign to save Sydney Park. We can then explain the process from there on. We encourage you to visit your tree, take photos with family, friends and pets. Whatever you see is a way of becoming bonded with your tree, as long as you don't damage it, of course. This exhibition is the first opportunity to select a tree, so you will have a choice of nearly all the trees. Um, or you could wait until our major adopter tree launch on Sunday, November 27th. There are some flyers here for that event. And there are people to thank for this event. The main one is Philip Bell, who has generously loaned us his gallery, which prompted this exhibition. Also, Marianne Coots, who has contributed her beautiful tree drawings, which are, by the way, for sale. Gabrielle Bates has brought in some of her amulets uh, and the plinths to put them on. She is here today, and I'm sure happy to chat with you later if you want to talk to her. Most of all, I want to thank my fellow committee members, Lori Graham and Janet Cossey, who have been great to work with and made our meetings such fun. I hope this exhibition will increase your awareness of the damage West Connects is already doing to our lives and community. I hope it will stimulate your thoughts and conversations about what you can do to fight this destructive force, starting with adopting a tree. Thank you so much for coming along. Thank you so much to Jackie for, uh, for chairing this. Um, which I know she was a little bit reluctant to do, but it's done so well. And I just want to let people know that you can buy a poster to support the campaign, um, and you can also adopt a tree by giving us a donation here. So speak to Jackie or me or Laurie if you would like to part with any money. <laughs> <laughs>